you can be seated. I'm just going to invite Alexander now to come and speak to us this evening. Um, it really is a great privilege to introduce Alexander. Uh, as you heard earlier, Alexander is the director of the Institute for Faith and Science at, in, in Marburg in Germany. Um, there's a lot more I could say by way of introduction, but he's given apologetic talks on all sorts of topics all over Europe. And indeed, he's been given all sorts of talks and contributing in all sorts of ways, chairing sessions, interpreting other speakers, um, interviewing people, giving seminars, and that's just over the last day or two. Um, and I, it's been a real privilege to work with Alexander and helping to coordinate the academics network. So, Alexander, it's a huge privilege. Thank you. Can I just pray for you? Lord, I pray that you will bless Alexander as he comes to speak to us. Lord, I pray that you will uh, give him clarity in what he says and that, Lord, you will give us ears to hear what you want to say to us this evening through him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah, thank you so much. It's really a great privilege to be with you all here and to work with David and Daniel and John in the Academics Network. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, Stefan Gustafsson, I think it was Stefan Gustafsson who introduced me to a Swedish fairy tale that Germans are only able to play Scrabble on soccer fields because our words are that long. So... <laughs> The first slide is just to prove that this is not true. It's a Swedish fairy tale. And there are even championships and competitions, and you only have to fill in a Kreuzfahrt-Rätsel-Meisterschafts-Anmeldeformular, which is one word, in order to take part in these competitions. <laughs> I really enjoyed uh, your talk, Stefan, last night. But I had some trouble because I thought, what can I add to that? Because it seems that I have read people who have read Francis Schaeffer or Stefan Gustafsson or both. And so maybe just telling the same again. But the same situation is true for Paul, who says, I don't mind to remind you of the same things again and again. And I think it's so, so important that we, um, that we are trained in how to approach people who think differently from us. It's so easy to talk about faith and salvation and the cross and sin in this context when we are together as Christians here in this room. But as soon as you are in academia, in the university, suddenly people do not understand a word when you talk about the blood of the lamb washing you uh, pure and purifies you from the sin and from all that. And so I think it's so important that we are able to communicate. And so maybe this talk helps a bit to make it more practical um, what Stefan uh, so well introduced about Francis Schaeffer's thoughts about worldviews and engaging other worldviews. And so I thought, what I can do is, Stefan went back into the last millennium, 20th, 20th century, to Francis Schaeffer. I go back further. I go back to the beginning of time. The first question. All the mess we are in began with a question, I would say. I want to read Genesis 3, verses 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in this garden? And the woman said to the serpent, oh, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Yeah, exactly. That's, I, I like that. It's so interactive with you. Amazing. I couldn't have... No, wow. <laughs> so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. 
So what actually happens here? And I think Francis Schaeffer borrowed his thoughts from maybe that text. What happens in the human mind? I found the thought really interesting. Eve comes to this tree with a notion of God, and she believes honestly that God is good. Eve comes to that tree with a view of the world. She knows this tree is a tree with risk potential. Eve comes to the tree with certain values. It is bad to eat from this tree because it's a tree with risk potential. And she comes with a certain action. I will avoid to eat from that tree. And then something happens. <laughs> the snake intrudes into this worldview of Eve. This has happened in our house last week, somehow, when we watched Jurassic Park. <laughs> so, the notion of God suddenly changes. God is not good anymore. He narrows me. He does not allow me to be like him. And hence, the view of the world changes. The tree is not a tree with risk potential, but a tree with power potential. And guess what happens to the values? It is not bad, but it is good to eat from that tree. And what happens with our actions, with the action of the woman? I do not avoid anymore, but I eat from the tree. I think this text at the very beginning of the Bible shows already how important our worldview is and how important for our worldview our notion of God is. And if you cross out God, it will change everything because it filters through to our very actions, through our values, our view of the world and everything. So the snake-induced thinking undermines God's reliability and trustworthiness and hence the relationship and the love is destroyed. What I learned from that is that questions never are only intellectual, but they always are relevant for a relationship. If I have doubts about something, that also casts a shadow on my relationship. And the Hebrew word for truth is emet. And emet not only means truth, but it also means trust. It's both the relational aspect and the truth aspect, the ontological aspect. Something firm to stand on, trust and truth. And questions can undermine this emit. And so, what happened afterwards? Sin came into the world, and death through sin, and death spread to all human beings because all have sinned. This happened in a spiritual way. Our trust in God was destroyed. In a social way, our trust in other people was destroyed. In a psychological way, trust in myself was destroyed. In a somatical way, the reliability of our bodies has faded away. And if you don't believe me, just get older and you will realize. So our ministry is a holistic ministry. It's deeds and it is words. We are here to heal the symptoms, but also to address the root causes and point to the cure of it. And so we are left in a world which asks this question, who am I, what am I doing, and where do I get answers? Also Calvin and Hobbes pursue this. I wonder why man was put on earth. What's our purpose? Why are we here? And the tiger gives the answer, tiger food. So the answer is always depending on your worldview and on your personal needs, of course. And a lot of isms actually try to lead us into wrong answers on what human beings are. If you ask the tiger, he will give you that answer. And not you are made in the image of God. So how can we challenge this situation of need in our world? Well, you are God's messengers. Just shortly, messengers on difficult ground. The Bible uses the word messenger and uh, I think uh, this is a brilliant illustration that I borrow from my friend Tim Vickers, who leads the Cross Current program of IFES. Um, he says, we are actually signposts. 
Um, signposts are based in a fundament. The fundament is our own trust in God. We must be rooted in Christ. If we are not rooted in Christ, if a signpost is not rooted in the ground, it will have no orientation. It will just wobble around and point in any direction, just depending on from which direction the wind is going. Then the post needs a post, of course, something that... Um, is erected from the foundation. And this is a trustworthy character, a character that establishes credibility. This is our life, a holy life. And we all have realized what it means if this is not the case and the post is broken. Um, there have been tragic cases in the last three, four years and before um, of people who did not have this trustworthy character, unfortunately. And then the message cannot be upheld. Only if the, if the character is strong, if there is a strong post, we can indicate the destination and make the message clear and point to Jesus. Actually, for every question, you only need to go to Bavaria because there is a city that is called Antwort. And Antwort in German means answer, response. So if you look for an Antwort, just come to Rosenheim in south of Bavaria and you will find it. And you will see the signposts to that village. And all of our communication, when we stand in public, it's always about building trust. Building trust by the way how we behave, by the way we speak, and by how we argue and what we convey. Communication is about building trust. But of course, communication can be uh, disturbed by hindrances, especially in the ears and minds of our listeners. So we need to overcome emotional barriers by showing empathy and sensitivity. We need to overcome rational barriers, thoughts that are erected against Christ by sound reasoning, giving good arguments, and volitional barriers um, that probably only can be overcome by persuasive lives and examples. And also, Con conscience barriers, I borrow that from Lindsay Brown's talk from the first night, he had four points, but conscience is closely related to volitional barriers, I would say, things that I want to do, but I know I should not do them, and still, only persuasive lives can change. In the rest of this talk, I will focus on rational barriers. Now, sound reasoning, because it is about how to deal with other worldviews and difficult questions, and this is a rational area. But always keep in mind, this is just one thing out of three or four. Apologetics, overcoming rational barriers. First Peter 3 is, uh, uh, First Peter 3 verse 15 is the famous foundation of apologetics. Always being prepared to make a defense, an apologia, as it says in Greek, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. This sounds a bit like the invitation to your PhD exam, to your PhD defense. And of course, be prepared to make a defense, to defend your PhD or to defend your faith. And what will you do in the days before you defend your PhD thesis? You will learn, of course, and you will try to understand as much as possible about your subject and your PhD. Um, to any professor who will ask you any question and reason for why your PhD thesis is true. And the same is true for the gospel. To anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Well, and taking this example of, of the PhD thesis, um, This verse can be misunderstood like in this comic, actually, in this cartoon. It can look like I'm on the side of Jesus and I'm a saved winner. And then there is this barrier to the professors and to those who think differently and challenge me. And they are the ignorant losers. But of course, this is a barrier that is hard to overcome if we think like that. The good thing is this verse continues, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So there is this emotional embracement of uh, your conversation partner. We can also think about it like that, that both of us are seeking truth, are seeking hope and meaning in life. And even though we have a good answer in Jesus, we have not all the answers to everything. So we are still seekers in some way and in some degree, and we seek for all of truth. And it's great to share that with a friend, with a person with whom we have a conversation. 
And this is not only true for one-to-one -one conversations, but when you give a talk, you actually are having 1,000 one-on-one conversations at the same time. It's always communicating one person to each one person. And we can raise interest by showing interest. And if we are not asked questions, then we can ask questions until finally we are asked questions. So how can we overcome this wall of doubt that is there between our atheist friend and Jesus? I'm very grateful to Nick Pollard and his book, Evangelism Made Slightly Less Difficult, which prophetically has a very great cover uh, indicating the corona disease, I think, but you will see it a few slides later. Um, he has six steps how we can go about this, and he calls it very postmodernly um, positive deconstructionism, which means deconstruct the wrong worldviews of other people, but in a positive way in order to make way for the gospel, for the good and true worldview, view of the world. And the first step is love and interest. Love is a very abstract term often to us, or is sometimes uh, associated with different meanings, erotic love and so on. But I think what we mean here is true interest, not just interest in earning more points in heaven and adding another convert or something, but having a true interest, what does my conversation partner actually believe? And so I can ask questions, for example. This, and uh, often the problem is that they don't seem to be interested. That's one of the problems that I often uh, encounter when I talk to other scientists or to economy students and so on. And so I think it's important to know how to connect to needs and how to show that the gospel is actually a beautiful response to our needs, what we long for. So guilt, forgiveness can be a bridge. Loneliness, fellowship and love, eternal love, eternal fellowship, suffering and the possibility and hope of healing and death and eternal life. So, for example, at a conference, I had a conversation with an economy student, PhD student, um, and we had different uh, talks, also some religious talks. And he said, well, actually, this conference is really interesting, but I don't know why these strange religious um, uh, contributions are part of this conference. Actually, they are not needed, are they? So do you know why they are there? Because you are one of the co-organizers of this conference. I said, well, you are an economy student. Would you be interested if I had a product that promises you eternal life? And he said, well, if you had that product, I would be really interested. And then I said, okay, that's why the religious talks are there, the Christian talks, because there is this possibility of getting eternal life. It's not like a product, but it's something that you can learn, and it's a relationship to Jesus Christ, and that's why we talk about that. And then we had a longer conversation, why I think this is true, and what that means, and so on. It was a door opener. There was this longing, eternal life, that sounds good, I want to have it. Or on a train ride, I had a discussion with a philosophy uh, PhD, um, and he was like, ah, all this stuff about God, it doesn't interest me when you ask me what I am doing and so on. And um, then I said, okay, would you be interested if I told you that I have a letter of someone who loves you and this is a love letter for you? And his first response was, no, 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 uh, because he realized that must be God and so on, so I'm not interested. And then I looked at him and are you sure about that? And he said, well, it would be somehow psychopathological if I would not be interested, of course. Um, <laughs> Of course, if someone knows there is a love letter for you by someone who really loves you, you are interested in that. And so use such questions maybe for raising an interest. And then we had a different ground to talk about these issues. Of course, we need to understand the gospel and the ground on which we stand ourselves. Um, third, we need to understand the worldview of our conversation partner. Um, where does he come from? And we need to ask questions. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And so on. I find it helpful uh, to think about the angle scale, not in terms of boxing in my conversation partner, but to know people are in different stages in their journey towards believing in Jesus Christ. There are some people who are even not aware that there could be a God. They are really far away of that. And then I need to meet them where they are. I cannot just proclaim the four spiritual laws and then the, uh, expect that they will co be converted. Miracles are possible, but rarely I have realized that this would really happen. So I would really connect to them at the point where they are. And so there are 
basically, I mean, you find that in the internet, the angle scale, if you are interested. Um, there are different steps. Like first, they need information. A lot of East German people, for example, they even don't know about the gospel because they've never heard about it. Then second, they need to understand it and correctly understand it and not misunderstand it. And then third, they need to understand that they are concerned themselves. A personal concern is the next step. It actually is something for you. It's not just an abstract theory. And then fourth comes the step, do you want to make a decision? Is that attractive to you? Do you want to bow down? And fifth, the application and the process of sanctification. And I think a very helpful thought is, Jesus, let me be a helper to help my conversation partner just to get one step further in that journey towards you. And if he takes two or three steps or even makes a decision, even better. But let's be in the same uh, um, speed as our uh, conversation partners, our friends. So how do we do that? How do we approach other people when we have talked about their worldview with them? Well, the fourth point, according to Nick Pollard, is confirm common ground. It's always better when I don't just challenge other people and tell them, well, I think completely differently than you do. Um, but it's good to start from a common ground. My favorite example for that is a story by Jürgen Spies, my predecessor as uh, the leader and director of the Institute of Faith. And he was invited, actually, to uh, um, a discussion, a debate with a leading German theologian who denies the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, Gerd Lüdemann. And um, this was organized by a Christian newspaper. And usually, um, and, and Jürgen Spies thought, I, I need to do this. I need to check where we agree. And so he did some studies on Gerd Lüdemann and he found out that there are five points that Gerd Lüdemann believes that also Jürgen Spies believed. And so he started the whole conversation with these five points. I think we too have these thoughts in common and these opinions. And so it's this, this, this. And the amazing reaction was Gerd Lüdemann was completely um, shocked, I would say, or he was completely taken by surprise. Because afterwards he said, this has never happened to me that an evangelical Christian would actually agree with me on five points. Usually they would only hit on me and show how wrong I am and all I, I think. But this was really different. And so the conversation was a completely different ground. But of course, it's not enough to just agree with people, but you will find points of agreement in all the worldviews because all the worldviews connect to reality. And so there are true things and true beliefs in every worldview, and we can connect to them and find common ground. But of course, we need to move on and challenge differences, challenge differences in other worldviews and highlight how we think differently and be able to argue why we think differently, why we think that that thought is more plausible than the other thought. But then, of course, in all the arguments, we can be wrong ourselves. I mean, we believe in Jesus and he is the truth, but not every thought that we have about Jesus is the truth. So a very big arrow the other way around. Be ready for revision. Be ready for rethinking your own thoughts. You might be wrong in some aspects of understanding the gospel. So such conversations can even help ourselves to get on with our faith. So I've talked about worldviews. What are worldviews? Worldviews make truth claims, always. Even if they claim that there is no truth, this is also a truth claim. And they give answer to basically these eight questions. First, the question of reality. What is really real? This is the question of trust, where, I can build, where can I build my life upon? Reality. Second, the question of origin. Where do we come from? This is all about belonging, because where I come from, there is my home. This is somehow my belonging. What is man, mankind? What is a human being? This is the question of identity. The question of meaning. To what purpose are we here? Purpose. Um, history. Where does history lead us to? The future, where does it all go to? Um, sixth, destiny. What happens after death? And is there hope for any kind of life after death? Moral, what should we do? Um, this is orientation, how we should behave, how we should act. And knowledge. In all these questions, what can we know? And so the question of assurance. How sure can we be of what we think is true? 
And if you have these questions in mind, you can actually always ask good questions with people who think differently. And you can ask them these questions. What do you think is really real after everything else? Where do you think do we come from? What is a human being? And I challenge you, if you don't know what to talk about with the academics tonight, um, maybe you might try some of these questions and ask them what they believe. And you will find commonalities and differences between different worldviews. So it's good to know how to answer these questions from a Christian point of view, from a Christian faith point. So, reality. What is the, real, the really real of reality? I would say it's the triune God, and he's the only eternal being. And this is great, because God is personal, and God is triune. He is a, 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 um, a fellowship. So love is woven into the basic fabric of reality, because God is a love relationship of persons. This is great. Origin. We are created not because of necessity. God had to, even though he didn't want to. But no, God created us because of his free sovereign will. He wanted us to be here. Again, really good and attractive news. You are not here by accident, but someone said, yes, I want you to be here. Human beings are the beloved image of God and at the same time, the proud and fallen rebel. The ambiguity of human beings finds a perfect explanation in the Christian view of man. Meaning. The meaning is God has good thoughts about us. He wants to save us and all of creation. He wants to bring us back into relying into his faithfulness, into this trustworthy love. There is meaning, relational meaning to it. History. All of history is actually aimed at this one goal in the future, this one day. The Bible again and again points to that one day when God will finally judge everything and restore um, his good purpose for creation. God's story for the good. Destiny. We have a destiny, an eternal home, a, t a home without any pain and suffering and death. New earth, new heaven, and eternal fellowship with an infinite God, we will never end up enjoying the presence of God and learning new things about him if he's really infinite, as I believe. Moral, what should we do? We should do God's will. We should love what brings joy and glory to God. So there are clear criteria for that. And knowledge, we can know something. Um, we don't have to be skeptics. Our knowledge is finite because we have limited minds and limited perception and so on. But we can know something and it is achievable, even though we cannot know everything. So that is against a lot of ideologies which claim we can know everything or we can know nothing. No, we are just in between. We can know something. We have senses, we have reason and revelation. So, testing worldviews. If you like to engage with people, it's good that there are three basic tests of worldviews. The first one is the test of consistency. That's the question, does it make sense what you believe? And there are some worldviews which do not really make sense in themselves. For example, relativism. You probably have heard that. If someone says everything is relative, then what about that statement? Is that statement relative to... Yeah, probably, it should be, but actually it's an absolute statement. But, of course, a relativist, a true relativist, will say, this criticism is only relative, so it's not relevant for me, and I will keep on being a relativist anyway. But you see, there are problems sometimes woven into the basic fabric of some worldviews. This is the internal consistency, but then there is the external correspondence. When we have a look at reality, does my worldview fit reality? Nature... And culture, what we find in nature and what we see in culture. Is it true that aliens came and planted life on this planet? Do we actually have any traces of aliens, for example? Um, and then third, the question of practicability. You might, be, you might find naturalists who have quite a consistent belief and who find a lot of correspondence in reality, even though, as an apologist, I would debate that, but let's assume it's possible. But can you really live what you believe if you're a true materialist? Can you, what is love? How can you love your husband? How can you love your wife if you're a true materialist? Well, love in the end is only a bunch of hormones and a level of hormones in your body. And so when your wife tells you, well, I really love you, and you say, Yes, my hormone level also indicates me I also love you. 
this is not really practicable, is it? So there are jumps of faith, and you can challenge them. For example, with one friend uh, in, in my physics studies, he was a physicist, and he said, well, actually, uh, there is no need to assume a creator. And at the same time, out of tradition, Bavaria, he still went to Catholic Church and took part in the Eucharist. And so I challenged him one day, how can you actually believe both? On the one hand, you believe that the universe is self-explaining, coming into existence by some kind of big bang and quantum fluctuation. And on the other hand, you go to church and then you say amen when the priest tells you this is the body of Christ. And he was really shocked. He did never bring that together, these, that this is somehow contradictory. He said, yeah, actually, it's a good question. That was a bit, okay, maybe I was too direct with that. And so I, I switched the uh, subject. But two months later, he approached me again. He said, Actually, Alexander, I want to thank you for this question because I've never thought about that. And now I've talked to my Catholic students pastor. He could have talked with me as well, but he did want to talk with his religious authority. And now he, he has a way of how to combine science and faith. And he was really thankful for that. And he came to nearly every SMD lecture that we organized uh, afterwards because he thought he can learn good things. And a great question that you can always ask someone is, what would have to happen that you change your worldview or that I change my worldview? That's a very good question to challenge people. What actually do you think would have to happen that you change your worldview? Because that will show you what is really on the heart of people and what really hinders them in order to believe in Jesus. I find this testimony really amazing by the uh, atheist philosopher Anthony Flew, who became at least a believer in some kind of deity, maybe in his last days even became a Christian. We don't know that for sure, but a friend of mine uh, was befriended with him and he joined a Baptist church in his last year. Um, he wrote a book, There is a God. Uh, actually, he wrote a book, There is no God, crossed out the no and said, There is a God. He was known to be one of the most notorious athe atheists, debating every Christian uh, on believing in God. And he writes in his book on page 88, after he explained why he had been an atheist, I now believe that the universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence. Why? This is the world picture as I see it that has emerged from modern science. First, the fact that nature obeys laws. Second, the dimension of life of intelligently organized and purpose-driven beings. And third, the very existence of nature. We must follow the argument wherever it leads. I think this is a very strong statement by a former atheist to say modern science has actually made me rethink my worldview. He says he still follows the same principle because I always follow the evidence, but yeah, he changed his worldview. So just a very short worldview journey in the Western world. And a great book on that is The Universe Next Door by James W. Sire, who is actually a follower of Francis Schaeffer, who is a follower of Jesus Christ, and so on. And um, I think this is really helpful. We started with Christian theism. Everything was grounded as an, in an active God Uh, after the Roman Empire, of course, and after uh, uh, Europe was evangelized. Um, everyone had the notion there is a God who created us and has a plan for our life. And then science led to the point that we realized, well, actually, the universe runs very much by its own, on its own, and we don't need a God to actually uphold it and so on. We just need someone who started the universe in the beginning. So it changed into deism, a passive God who just winded up the clockwork and then it ran on itself. But living with such a God is a very metastable phenomenon, I would say, because if God only was the first cause and then everything runs on itself, do we really need that first cause in the end? Well, maybe nature is a self-contained system and is eternal in itself. That was the next step. So God was crossed out completely and we ended up in naturalism. But naturalism, again, um, is not a stable theory again, because When you want to live naturalism, you realize there is no meaning, there is no hope, there is no moral, there is no fundament for anything, so you end up in nihilism, as Nietzsche has very well shown. Nihilism. And then, with nihilism, no one can live. Suicide would be the logical consequence, because why should I live if I come from nothing, and I go to nothing, and I am nothing, and there is no meaning in nothing? We need meaning, and so we need to accept the absurdity of nihilism, of this world, of this material world, without a God, but we need to create our own meaning. And this was the road into existentialism. And then, of course, we had this uh, cultural uh, mixing because of the globalization with other cultures. So pantheism from the Eastern world entered, and New Age 
Western forms of pantheism and postmodernism and so on. And now we live in a globalized world where you can find every worldview next door, actually, the universe next door. To summarize, that is, the journey that we took in the Western world is we started with a God who says, I am who I am, who defines our being, not only our being, but the being of the whole universe. God's being in Revelation is the origin for humanity, for knowledge, and for ethics. There is a reference point which helps us to see ourselves and define ourselves. Not only a reference point, but of course a person to relate to and to get meaning from. But then God was crossed out and we ended up with human reason as this reference point. Cogito ergo sum, Descartes. So thinking instead of being. Human reason, including experience and logic, as the origin for humanity, knowledge, and ethics. But then, thinking, in the end, is a very unreliable thing somehow. You can think like that, you can think like that, and so on. So, in the end, we ended up with disillusionment. Not only, not anymore, am I am who I am from God, or cogito ergo sum, but the question, am I? Am I really? Nietzsche said, truths are illusions of which we have forgotten that they are illusions. We end up in absurdity. And fourth, we need meaning and we get meaning from invention. I am what I make of myself. Welcome to the modern world. I construe myself, constructivism. Find your own story. And we can test these worldviews. I can't go into all that, but the Lama and uh, Lik Lama, I didn't know that, but <laughs> Lik Lama will help you, the fellowship of graduates and uh, of postgrads and so on. What would have to happen that I change my worldview? I love Lamas, but I also love uh, Nandus, by the way. So my final chapter, very short chapter, just a little concentration, then we, have, then we are done. How can we deal with difficult questions? Because, of course, these conversations can be very difficult because people think as well and they have good arguments for their own position. Should we avoid this maybe because of difficult questions? And I think, no, we should be prepared. And how can I prepare for difficult questions? I have five points about this. Um, when, when, I hear, when I hear a difficult question I, uh, and I don't have much time, I first think about motivation. Is this question really serious? Is it a serious question or is it just a power play question? For example, the question about suffering. A lot of people know if I want to tease a Christian, I just need to ask the Christian, well, how can there be a good and almighty God and so much suffering? Hee <laughs> hee, I've refuted your faith and so on. And if that is the case and the person isn't really interested in an answer, it doesn't make sense to invest a lot of time and energy to talk about it. So I would ask back to that person, Let's assume I could give you a reasonable, plausible answer to that question. Would that make a difference in what you believe and how you think about Christianity? And if the person says, actually not, then I can say, so what would make a difference? And I can come to the true question that is really on the heart of the person. And if the person says, yes, it would really make a, dif a, a difference for me, then I know, yes, it's worth investing time in talking about that question. Second point, think about the logic of questions. Every question comes with some kind of internal consistencies. What are the premises that lead to a conclusion? For example, the question, who created God? Have you come across this question before, maybe? Who created God? Um, what are the premises of that uh, conclusion? Well, I would say the first premise is everything that exists has a beginning. And second, God exists. Hence, he has a beginning. That's the logic of that argument. But the question is, is it true? Is it true that everything that exists has a beginning? Well, even naturalists do not necessarily believe that because they believe that energy and matter is eternal. So not everything that exists must have a beginning. And if we ask the question, who created God, we assume immediately that God is just one other everything that must have a beginning because it exists. But why could it not be that God has no beginning because he is eternal, just rightly because he is God? So what are the explicit and implicit premises? Um, and what are the conclusions? And do the conclusions of an argument really follow from the logic of the argument? This is all about logical theory and so on. There are great books about that. For example, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview by William Lane Craig, where he goes through all these syllogisms with great examples. If you want to learn about that, I encourage you to buy that book. 
And in order to just calm and get some peace inside, you can always ask a question, what would be the worst case conclusion if that question really would be true? Um, and a lot of questions you will realize, they might challenge some parts of my faith, but they would not really even challenge the center of my faith. I mean, the question of suffering might be a little bit different, but a lot of questions would not really challenge my, the heart of my uh, faith, actually. For example, uh, evolution and creation, this is not really about the heart of my faith in Jesus Christ, I would say. So a lot of these questions, I can even admit without problems, I don't know. I have questions myself, and they are actually not about the heart of my faith. Third, plausibility. Once I have analyzed the logical structure of an argument, um, I can check external correspondence. Do the premises actually fit my knowledge about the world? The facts that I learned, like archaeological evidence for the reliability of the New Testament would be an example for that. Or do the premises actually fit my Bible knowledge, what I know from God's word? For example, when it's about suffering, Yes, in the world there is suffering. Does the Bible talk about suffering? Yes, a lot. It talks about suffering. And it even brings the suffering towards God and uh, um, mourns about suffering and so on. So suffering is a very important point of the Bible. And then another good question is always, what would other worldviews say about that question? Do other worldviews have a better story? For example, about suffering, do they give more hope and so on? That's a good question to ask. How would you interpret this in your worldview, for example? Play the ball back sometimes. And then fourth, very important, the Jesus connection. I think every question about reality, because all reality is God's reality, is somehow connected to Jesus. Where is Jesus concerned? In what way is Jesus the answer? Even though sometimes it can be a really, really long way, of course. But in the end, I don't want to discuss about scientific details about the fine-tuning of the universe or something, but in the end, I want to somehow connect my argument with Jesus and talk about his resurrection and life and that he's still alive and I can have a relationship today and now with him. And fifth, a question about everyday life. You can challenge people who seem to be very consistent. Can you actually live it? And think about that example. What do you think? Why do you love your wife if you are a materialist, for example? What are these implications for daily life? So I know this, a lot of that might have been known to you beforehand because Stefan talked about similar issues. I hope this helps you a bit to apply Francis Schaeffer's teaching a bit more to your life. And be courageous. You can be prepared. Um, it's absolutely interesting and fascinating to learn about other worldviews and sometimes learn connections. I could tell you quite a few interesting stories, like uh, on a train with a Reiki master from Indonesia who knew the first letter of John by heart and so on. Very interesting, but my time is up, I think. So just some recommended literature. Here is the cover, by the way, by Nick Pollard, the coronavirus prophecy, evangelism made slightly less difficult. Uh, and then six books by John Lennox. John Lennox loves uh, one-color books, obviously. Brown, blue, yellow, green. So being truly human, finding ultimate reality, questioning our knowledge, doing what's right, claiming to answer, suffering life's, pa life's path, uh, life's pain. Um, and the universe next door. Good books to read. Just start at some at one of that book. Thank you very much, and be blessed and equipped. <laughs>